Okay, the line has diminished. Let us begin. Please have your seats. I got a new podium this year. That's my podium. This is the short one. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to Litchfield's town deliberative session. My name is John Regan. I live at 9 Chaseburg Circle. Circle with my wife, Patricia, who you met checking in today, and my son, Daniel, who you also met checking in today. I'd like to recognize Mr. Phil Reed. He's our assistant moderator up there in the corner. And Phil, I'm not sure you, would, you knew, but we enlisted Daniel as a pay, an unpaid intern this year to help us with administrative duties. So thank you, Daniel. A uh, few administrative announcements. State law prohibits smoking anywhere on school grounds. Please do not light up. Restrooms are located just to the right out here as you leave the, uh, the room. Food and drink are not allowed. Water's allowed. Um, it's against school policy to leave flyers on vehicles parked on school property. Please don't do that. Um, before we begin the meeting tonight, please stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, to begin, I'd like to invite Mr. Lemire, the chair of the selectmen, to come up and introduce his, his committee. Switch podium. <laughs> <laughs> there. Good morning, all, and welcome. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, most members of the board. Uh, I'm Brent Lemire. I, I'm currently serving as chair. We have um, Vice Chair Steve Perry, uh, John Brunel, and Kurt Schaefer. Selectman Bork is texting me this morning. He's, uh, it's Kevin Bork. He's on his way back from New Jersey and hopes to arrive here in time to finish the meeting. So thank you. Mr. We'll hurry. Yeah. And I'd also like to invite Ms. Couture to come up and introduce her budget committee. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Cindy Couture. I'm the chair. Uh, Carrie Douglas is Vice Chair, Jim Spots, Dennis Miller, Jen Burke, Bob Keating, John Brunell is the Selectman's Rep, and Christina Harrison is a School Board's Representative, and we do have a vacant position um, that it was a resigned position in mid-October, um, uh, so we do have an empty position while we deliberate. Thank you. You, you missed it, but... Carrie Brienne is sitting here also. She's the town clerk. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll go through the moderator's rules. Um, huh? Oh, and we got Troy. Troy Brown is over here. He's the town administrator as well. Give, give us a wave, Troy. Okay, the, uh, the, the rules for this evening's meeting, this, this morning's meeting, Litchfield is operating under what is known as Senate Bill 2 procedures. This means that our function this evening, today, is to review and discuss the warrant articles that have been presented here today and for us to vote on on election, on official ballot on election day. Election day is on March 13th, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, the polls here at Campbell High School will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. According to state law, town and school district meetings are run by the moderator's rules. This means that the moderator sets the ground rules for the meeting. However, law also allows you to overrule the moderator's ruling by approving a motion to do so by simple majority vote. For this deliberative session, the moderator will read each warrant article and recognize a sponsor to speak about it. Then the moderator will open the floor for discussion. When you come to ask a question or discuss an article at any microphone here on the floor, please clearly state your name and street address so that the clerk Terry can hear you. If a voter wishes to propose an amendment to an article, she must have the amendment moved and seconded before it can be discussed. 
If we make no amendments to these warrant articles, then they will appear on the ballot as you see them tonight written. If we do make amendments to these warrant articles, then they will appear on the ballot as amended. <coughs> amendments to warrant articles must be handed to the moderator in writing. Uh, there are index cards and pens and paper here on the, on the floor if you need to write anything down. Um, note that the amendment cannot change the primary subject directed, uh, described in the article. The maker of a motion to amend an article will have the first opportunity to speak to it. Each proposed amendment will be brought to closure before any other amendment is discussed. At this auditorium, non-voters. Okay, do we have a hand? Can we see non-voters in the, in the room here today? I need to ask non-voters, are, are you all speaking on, on tonight? Are you speaking tonight, sir? You, you, you really want to be up in that corner up there. All non-voters need to be up in that direction up, the, up in the area. Okay. Um, all right. As you entered the, audit, the building tonight, the ballot clerk uh, gave each registered voter a sheet of yes-no ballots. Tonight we have yellow. Uh, these are yours to use for secret ballots. Please do not drop them on the floor or leave them behind if you leave before the close of the meeting. Only those voters who are on the checklist as qualified voters are permitted to vote to amend an article. If the moderator receives a complaint or notices a non-voter voting, then he will require the non-voter to leave the auditorium. The moderator must conduct a secret yes-no ballot when five voters make a written request prior to a voice hand standing or division vote on the article. The moderator must conduct a secret yes-no ballot when seven or more voters challenge any vote to amend an article immediately after the vote is declared by the moderator and before any other business has begun. Approval of, any, of, of all warrant article amendments at the deliberative session shall be by simple majority vote. A voice vote will be the primary method of voting. If the moderator cannot distinguish a clear majority with a voice vote, then a vote of standing or hands will be taken. Active campaigning for your favorite Warren article, handout standing in, with signs is allowed outside in the hallway, not in this room. Active campaigning, yeah. The deliberative session is a forum at which we ask questions. More importantly, it's a place for debate. Um, proper respect and decorum will be expected at all times. Every effort will be made to give rec uh, rec recognition to all wishing to speak. If you want to speak, then you must come to the microphone to do so. Board members, if you're speaking as a board member discussing an article, you may remain on stage. If you're offering your opinion as a citizen, then please move to the floor, uh, the floor microphones. All those who speak are to keep their remarks pertinent to the motion. There will be no negative motions will be in order, no personal attacks, no profanity. All speakers will direct their remarks to me, the moderator. When a question is asked, the moderator will call upon the appropriate person to respond to the question. The moderator will allow one follow-up question with uh, when others are waiting to speak and will not allow running discussions as best I can. A motion to call the question and stop the discussion must be properly seconded before it can be considered. Voters who speak to an article may not immediately call the question in order to stop discussion about it. A motion to table an article will not be in order unless it is to table until a specific time and place before the close of this meeting. There's only five more. A motion to reconsider or restrict reconsideration of an article after discussion is closed will not be in order unless seconded and approved. Reconsidered articles must be discussed and closure reached before the end of the meeting. A motion to adjourn or recess will not be accepted until all warrant articles have been discussed. Members of boards and committee members and voters will refrain from using acronyms, best they can. And that's it. So, um, your first point of order, it is your prerogative to permit non-voters to speak at this meeting. It has been customary to allow co uh, employees, council, non-registered residents to speak at these meetings. If you wish to continue to do so, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Okay, here we go. So Article 1, Election of Offices, two budget committee, three-year term, two budget committee, two-year term, one cemetery trustee, three-year term, one checklist supervisor, three-year term. Six -year term. What? Six -year term. Who, who didn't do that one right? Six -year term. Which one? Okay. That's going to be changed on the ballot? Okay. So um, the, one, the one checklist supervisor is, in fact, a six-year term. One library trustee, three-year term. One library trustee, two-year term. One moderator, three-year term. 
one selectman, three-year term, one trustee of trust funds, three-year term. There really isn't any opportunity to discuss that. No changes really can be made. So we'll go to the next article. It'll be, it'll be presented on the, on the ballot as written with that one change for, for checklist supervisor for six-year term. Yes. George. I didn't see you, George. Sorry. I understand. I'm very short. You are. <laughs> um, George Lambert, three listed, Lane and Litchfield. Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Uh, I have a personal inquiry first, and then I have a uh, procedural request. Okay. Uh, did anyone file to run for uh, moderator for the next three years? I signed up to be moderator last Friday. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah. Do you have another question? Yes, I do. Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know whether or not a motion would be in order to change the order of discussion on the warrant articles to take up Article 5 in the operating budget, followed by Article 13 for the disposal of the fire station, and then Article 4 for the fire station bond in that order, so that we can actually group the two warrant articles directly after the operating budget, but put the two subject matter items together. Would that motion be in order? I'm inclined to agree. Do we have any legal counsel on that? Would that be a problem legally to do that? No, you can do that. Do we have a second to change the order of the article discussion from one, two, three, four, five to one, two, three, five, thirteen, four? We have a second. Do I need to be more detailed on that, or is that okay. Thank you. Do you want to discuss it, George? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for members of the select board and everyone else and the public. This is a procedural thing. I apologize. There's a topic that a lot of people in town are interested in, which is what are we going to do? with the old fire station, but a discussion about are we going to fund the fire station followed an hour or two later, potentially, with a discussion of what we're going to do with the building would actually be discontinuous. So putting the two together and saying, what are we going to do with the building if we actually adopt the bond allows everyone to be clear and will probably make it so that if we need to make any amendments, we can make any appropriate <coughs> amendments. So procedurally, this will just make things go faster and easier. I would appreciate an affirmative vote so that we can make this happen. Thank you for the time. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment motion to change the order of discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. We'll be changing the order of discussion from one, two, three, four, five consecutive to one, two, three, five, thirteen, four. Yeah. Okay. So Article Two, the zoning amendment number one. Are you in favor of the adoption of amendment number one as proposed by the planning board for the town of Litchfield zoning ordinance as follows? Amend section 507.05B, accessory dwelling units, administration to remove requirements for a certificate of compliance upon conveyance of the property. This is recommended by the planning board 500. Um, Mr. Croto was going to talk to it, John. Yeah. Mr. Croto is the chair of the planning board. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Michael Croto, Six Garden Drive, Litchfield Planning Board uh, Chairman. Um, I'm just going to be very brief on this. Uh, the reason for the change or the amendment to this um, ordinance is specifically recommended by Town Council um, that the uh, provision of Section B as to the um, Certificate of Compliance was basically unenforceable. That's why we are changing this. And that's it. Further discussion, any questions on Article 2? Okay, it's a zoning article. We really don't have an opportunity to change it, so you'll find it on the ballot as written. Thank you. Article 3, Zoning Amendment Number 2. Are you in favor of the adoption of Amendment Number 2 as proposed by the Planning Board for the Town of Litchfield Zoning Ordinance as follows? Adopt a new section, uh, 1040.00, Demolition Review Ordinance. 
to allow for a review of historic structures prior to demolition. The ordinance proposes a delay of up to 40 days prior to issuance of a demolition permit to structures built prior to 1960 and greater than 500 square feet that are architecturally, culturally, or historically significant. This delay should allow an opportunity to consider preservation options or alter alternatives to demolition. This article shall take effect on July 1, 2018. This article is contingent on, a, on an affirmative vote on Article 13, um, which establishes a Heritage Commission. Should Article 12 fail, this article will be null and void. This is recommended by the Planning Board 500. So Mr. Queenan was going to come and discuss this. Ms. Queenan, sorry. Kimberly Queen in to Newstead Street, currently the Vice Chairman of the Planning Board. Can we go this way? Okay. <clears throat> the town residents and master plan frequently note that, in the pro that the protection of local character, particularly historic and agricultural character, is a top priority. Yet other than outright purchase of land and buildings, there are a few means to achieve this goal. Litchfield has a wonderful history of buildings, many of which are some of the oldest in New Hampshire, and yet they are left mostly unprotected. The proposed demolition review ordinance is a way to allow the town and residents an opportunity to try to save cherished landmarks should they ever be isolated for de uh, demolition. The demolition review process has been drafted to integrate with existing town ordinance, permitting, and staffing structure. The intent is to minimize any disruptions in cost, protect individual property rights, while seeking to implement the town's vision of protecting community character. The process creates a pause of up to 38 days before a demolition permit is issued for historic, architectural, or culturally significant structures. The process is designed to integrate with existing towns, personnel roles, and responsibilities. The timeline to adhere is as close as possible to uh, the existing demolition process permit with a slight delay. The property, uh, excuse me, the property owners will have no property restrictions. The property owner retains the ability to sell, modify, or demolition their property. The property owner at any time may withdraw their demolition application during this process. I'd like you to notice the balance symbol here. That is what this process is trying to balance, trying to maintain your past history while we grow into the future. And we're trying to balance the property rights owners with a chance for the public to pause and maybe um, uh, speak to trying to preserve the building. The public must understand that ultimately it is the decision of the property owner to demolish or save a building. A quick walkthrough of how the ordinance would work. A demolition permit is submitted to the building inspector. That's current practice. The building inspector has three business days to perform the following. Determine if the structure is 500 square feet or larger and built prior to 1960. 1960 was chosen because the housing booms in Litchfield occurred after that. They would, that, that building inspector would also determine if the building is safe or unsafe. If a permit request does not trip this threshold of being greater than 500 square feet and built prior to 1960, the owner is notified and the demo permit is issued according to current practice. 83% of the structures in Litchfield will, within three days, have their permit approved for demolition. If it does meet this threshold, then the owner is notified. 17% fall into this demo review process for structures built prior to, uh, after 1960. If the structure is deemed uh, non-sound or unsafe, such as the floor might be unstable or the silo might be ready to tip over, then the demolition may proceed. However, the owners might be asked if the town can take photos or salvage the building elements if the structure is significant. If the structure is structurally sound and safe and was built prior to 1960 and is 500 square feet or larger, there is one more test for, uh, to apply before a property may be subject to the full demolition delay. 
The Heritage Commission is also proposed for 2018 and will confer as determined if it's, a, the, what the Heritage Commission will do is to, uh, will determine if it's historically or actual, uh, architecturally or culturally significant. This determination is to be made with eight business day, within eight business days of the original permit application date. That is, there was three days for the building um, inspector to determine whether it was uh, going to meet the criteria of over 500 square feet and um, built prior to 1960, and then five days for the Heritage Commission to determine if, it, the, if the building is significant historically, architecturally, or culturally. At this point, 560 structures in Litchfield remain. That's the 17% that came to this process, uh, you know, that it was um, potentially significant. Uh, there are currently 17, uh, 77 houses identified in 1998 uh, through the, uh, a survey done by the National Regional Planning Commission. That survey looked at homes along the Route 3A corridor from nine, for those homes were dated from 1740 to 1958. We'll use that as a metric to estimate how many more people would potentially go into the demolition process. So if the structure from the Heritage Commission is deemed not significant, the demolition permit is issued with little or no delay, and it goes through. If it is significant, a pause is initiated to allow for review and public comment. Another 14.6% uh, will be thrown out of the demolition ordinance here because they are old, but they're not historically significant. That means that 97.66% of the structures in Litchfield would not go through this process. Only 2.34% are potentially significant and will require a pause to be initiated to allow for review and public comment. Uh, just a quick note, I contacted the NRPC and asked to get a statistic in case somebody asked uh, for the city of Concord, in the last five years, the demolition review ordinance has only been invoked three times. Just to let you know that it's not going to happen on a frequent basis. When this pause is at, oh, sorry. When this pause is initiated for the select few buildings, the 2.34% of potential structures in Litchfield prior to demolition, a hearing is scheduled to receive public input. The property owner is notified to come up and pick up a sign to be placed in a visible location that can be seen by the road. Public notice is also issued into the newspaper. The owner or a representative of the owner is encouraged to attend the hearing. Attendance is optional. You cannot enforce a property owner to attend the meeting or the hearing. At the hearing, which is, would be run by the Heritage Commission, the public can voice support for the demolition, concerns about the demolition, or propose alternatives. Some alternatives might be to educate the owner on what the structure is and why it is significant, by, by, by time to find another buyer, might adapt it for new use to maybe keep the outside of the building looking a certain way, but they can modernize the inside of the building, move the building, rehabilitate with tax incentives or other financial assistance. At the, con at the conclusion of the Heritage Commission meeting, the Heritage Commission will make a non-binding recommendation. The Heritage Commission is advisory only, so it's just going to make a non-binding recommendation of what happened during the meeting. That hearing must be held within 25 days. After the hearing, the, public that the property owner decides whether to demolish, save, or identify and apply any alternatives to the structure. There are 10 days set aside for the Heritage Commission to work with the owner to identify any alternatives to the demolition if that was the desired outcome of the property owner. At minimum, with consent of the property owner, it, it provides a uh, time to document the structure before any demolition is approved. As the administration of the demolition review is contingent on the establishment of a Heritage Commission, this warrant article is contingent upon the passage of a Heritage Commission proposed by the selectmen working in conjunction with the planning board. The last item I would like to uh, say is not everybody would fall into this process. The planning board only has authority for non-governmental use buildings. The board of selectmen have um, oversight of the government use building. So for example, you're heading down Route 3A, you're looking at the homes, most private residences or private businesses would fall into this potentially. 
Um, if you're going down Route 3, just picture you come up to the library on the left. The library would not go through this process because it's not, it's a government, it, rather, it's a government use building. The resident next to it probably would. The Presbytery Church um, is owned, um, the Presbyterian Church, it's owned by the Presbytery. It probably would go in here if there was not uh, some kind of government lease going on I don't know about. The fire station would not go through this process. The old town hall would not go through this process. The resident next to it probably would. The 1930 Griffin School would not go through this process, but the two houses across the street probably would. I just wanted that clear. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. Would this process anyway, well, let me put, put it another way. That a process whereby the fire, fire chief, building inspector, and selectmen can determine if a building is unsafe and be demolished. Does this any way prevent that? There was a, uh, to determine whether it was unsafe or not takes two processes. One is the building inspector, and they would also work with the fire department, because the fire department could also deem it unsafe. That was the check and balance put in. George Lambert, three lists to lane. Yep. Hi. Hi. So, uh, why government? Is there anything here that can't be accomplished on a voluntary basis? And why do we need government to do this? Okay. Because, yep. you know, there is, these are property owners. Mm -hmm. If I were to, I don't know, have a bet with my neighbor, he's up on the stage, hi Steve. And we were to say, you know what, I'm going to go and I want to demolish my shed right now. If I lose a coin flip, I should be able to, with my property, at the loss of a coin flip, be able to have the building destroyed. But with this process, if it was built before 1960 and was over 500 square feet, mm -hmm. that would not be the case. We still have to get a demolition permit anyway. Mm, do I? I don't have to get a, a building permit to put a shed on my property. Well, I, I, I think you still need a permit, but I would let the building inspector say that, but you asked about why it would be government. Yeah. The why do we need? OK, hold on. Not, why is it a yeah. good idea? Yeah. Why do we actually need government to intervene in this situation? The reason is, <clears throat> first of all, the Heritage Commission is made up of volunteers. So there is, it's going to cost 0 to $300 a year to run. Second of all, we need a ch this, this was designed to pause and let the public speak, not just like a, a, a few people in the town. So that's why it was done. And to, to have the transparency, we would need a Heritage Commission to you know, um, take meeting minutes, uh, have it on cable. That's, that's how the Heritage Commission was designed to work. S follow? You got one behind you, but OK. OK, I'll be quick. Mm -hmm. So. You're saying that this can't be done on a voluntary basis? I'm saying it was designed to allow the community to weigh in, to pause and weigh in whether they value that structure to be historically or culturally or architecturally significant. It allows everybody to have a say. With, in with my property. Thank yes. you. Thank yep. you very much. You're welcome. Chris Pascucci, 12 Colonial Drive. The way this is being packaged, it, you know, I'm almost thinking I should thank everyone for allowing the entire community to have input on my personal property and my personal property rights. Anyone that believes in limited government, uh, personal property rights, should obviously vote against this, vote against the Heritage Commission. I mean, a lot of words in here solicit public input. It, it sounds nice. If I buy a piece of property that was built in 1959 for the sole purpose to demolish it for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, why should I allow everyone in the town to educate me, as you put it, as to why I should knock that property down? They're not, they're not there to educate. Um, again, it's just a pause to see if they want to weigh in. Remember, you don't have to attend it. You don't have to be there. By not showing up to the meeting, you've said what you're going to do. But I understand what you're saying. Again, we're trying to weigh the rights of the property owner 
to with you know the 10,000 residents that might for some reason be thinking that building the and that can only happen by government force once well that's the question but right? that's that's the, yeah. well like, it's, it hasn't happened in, because right yeah. now there is no weighing of my property rights I have property rights I understand a demolition mm -hmm. permit so we are anybody voting for this is is now inserting the government right in the middle of, of what you uh, are currently allowed to do with a simple process. I understand all the, the pretty words uh, solicit public and create a short delay. Uh, we want to test a, on a Heritage Commission review uh, what's needed. It's non-binding advisory. So then the, on the other side of the scale, non-binding and advisory, so in other words, all of this really is meaningless is what you're saying because it's non-binding and advisory. But it might change the mind of the owner and that just like mr. Lambert said that could be done without government but, that but, could be but done voluntarily. how do you get everybody to the table in a transparent way that that's what we're yeah. saying there could be offline discussions happening it, but it, it just should gives be the burden to... of the people if they feel necessary as opposed to pausing my rights as a building owner I suggest everyone vote no on this preserve personal property rights as it was meant in the Constitution and please vote no on this entire process Thank you. Rich LaSalle is 236 Charles Bancroft Highway. Uh, my wife and I would definitely be impacted by this. Our house was built in 1771 and was uh, once owned, they tell me, I wasn't around, by a signer of the Declaration of uh, Independence, Matthew Thornton. So from a historical standpoint, it would be significant. Now this winter, we've gone through a very brutal winter. Uh, there for about two weeks, uh, we were scrambling because we had pipes freezing and furnaces going out and, and so forth. I'm a tremendous lover of history, but it did cross my mind, what the heck are we doing in this old house? Now, my question, and I understand the purpose of this, my question is that if we decided to tear down our house and put up a nice modular structure that wouldn't have freezing pipes, um, and we went through this process, but our mind wasn't changed, what would the outcome of that be? You get your demolition permit. And everybody in town would hate me. The decision of the, the last step of that, no, no, <laughs> well, I might, but the last step of that is after the, after the uh, Heritage Committee, after you have the public hearing, you, they sure. don't need to know what your decision is. They'll figure it out when they drive by, maybe in three months. When Should I drop the microphone? <laughs> 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 Further discussion on Article 3. Michael Croto, uh, Six Garden Drive, Chair of the Litchfield Planning Board. Just a couple of things. Number one, this, um, this ordinance uh, is basically contingent on the passing of the uh, ordinance for the Heritage Commission, which will be coming up later on in the uh, presentation uh, today. Um, if the Heritage Commission does not pass, this ordinance becomes null and void. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, Keep in mind, this is only, this is nothing to do with the issue of taking away property rights, okay? Let's be clear about that. This is, has to do with historical buildings. Historical buildings that have been in the town prior to 1960 that we want to be able to preserve as aesthetic to the character of the town. Um, and we feel that this is an important step in ensuring that those uh, buildings are at least saved, not necessarily demolished, but what can be done to protect them. Demolished, I think, is really the last resort here. But again, we are not taking property owners' rights away from them. It has nothing to do with that. It has all only has to do here with the historical aspects of Litchfield as the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicole Forty at 85 Page Road. Um, what I just wanted to say kind of in response to the previous person's point, um, I 
would feel less judgmental of someone who was willing to at least hear the input of other people in the town and you know having a house that old um, what that adds to the town and the character and what it means and to see um, in the one scenario where it's just gone and what was the thought process and not really knowing not having the transparency um, establishing the heritage committee um, would allow us to see what goes on in those deliberations and I feel that that's really what I want from my government is the transparency to see what's going on um, and I know that I would have a lot more respect for someone who is willing to hear and be part of a discussion rather than just making that decision and then suddenly this structure is gone. Cindy Couture, 41 Stark Lane. I'm not really a fan of having um, my neighbors weigh in on what I do with my property, but one thing that struck me about this that I think is very important would be to, um, it, uh, the wording was, I think, to um, uh, document what existed in the structure. And I think that's actually pretty important. Um, we have some very old and historically significant buildings. And if that 40 days at least allowed us to document what was in that building, perhaps uh, through uh, you know, um, pictures or um, structural um, reviews, um, then that can be saved and the building destroyed and that, that history is not lost. So that's one piece that struck me as being very important um, and very valuable as part of this um, ordinance. Um, but like I said, I'm not really a fan of having my neighbors then judge me for what I decide to do after the fact. So that is a, a detriment. Yep. Thank you. Further discussion, Dennis? Dennis Miller, 37 Wren Street. Um, you referenced the 1960 date. Is that fixed or is that going to move in five or 10 or 15 years? If, if this passes and becomes an ordinance, that could always be modified. If so it's got to be modified. If they want. Can it be modified by the selectmen or does it have to come back to town? Meeting? I think it probably the planning board owns this ordinance and probably go through them. So, you know, you probably have more meetings. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I, I would just worry that people say, oh, it doesn't bother me. My house was built in 1970. Right. 97% of you would years, say, they they say why did I vote yes on that? Because I need to do something. Thank you. Further discussion on Article 3? Okay, hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. Okay, so we're going to discuss Article 5, which is the operating budget. 2018 operating budget. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate as an operating budget not including appropriations by special warrant articles and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth in the budget posted with the warrant or as amended by the vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein, totaling $6,215,024. Should this article be defeated, the default budget shall be $6,112,492, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by previous actions of the town of Litchfield or by law, well, the governing body may hold one special meeting in accordance with RSA 40 colon 13, 10, and 16 to take up the issue of a revised operating budget only. The estimated 2018 tax impact is seven cents. This is recommended by the Selectman 500 and Budget Committee 600, Mrs. Couture, to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, budget information was presented over a two-week period in October by the um, selectman's representative, uh, the town business administrator, and department heads as needed. The committee used a streamlined process this year where we wanted to hear all of the departments and get all of the information before we made any decisions. Uh, the new this year is the uh, voter approved tax cap, um, which uh, limits the amount uh, of tax uh, uh, dollars that can be appropriated. Um, we held two meetings then to determine uh, what the budget will be, one meeting that looked at the base budget itself, and then another meeting that looked at Warren articles. There was a separate meeting for the fire department presentation. We look at um, three-year um, historical averages. We look at the tax cap calculation, which limits us to $175,000 of tax impact. Uh, we look at the rationale of why uh, these dollars are being uh, proposed, and then we look at what is a reasonable amount to present to the community. 
Some things that impacted the budget this year. Uh, health insurance was a pretty significant increase. It was 17.36% increase, which was on top of last year's 20, over 20% 20 increase. Um, that would have meant $75,000 increase uh, in the budget. Um, the selectmen were able to renegotiate um, health uh, um, insurance and able to come in flat. Um, but when we initially received the budget, this was a, a huge impact. Uh, last year, a new police officer was approved, and what was in the budget last year was six months of that uh, uh, contract. Um, going forward, we have to add in this, the second six months of the contract for a full year, so that was a $36,000 increase. Uh, personnel administration, uh, between union contract increases, retirement increases, Social Security. Uh, the town also went to a merit uh, pay-based um, um, increases. And so those impacted the budget. Uh, fire hydrants. So due to the single bay and water project, um, several fire hydrants came online, which added $153,000 to the budget. Legal fees. Uh, again, due to the single bay and PFOA um, issue, um, our legal fees have been increasing. Uh, parks and Recreation saw uh, just under $10,000 increase in field maintenance. The fire department is proposing to replace a 20-year-old Jaws of Life uh, piece of equipment for $30,000. Uh, there were also slight increases in our um, utilities, um, about $10,000 in trying to replenish our salt stores for our highway department, and uh, our solid waste department has also seen some increases in the contracts they use, primarily for uh, demolition material. After reviewing the selectmen's uh, proposed budget, uh, the budget committee made a number of reductions. Um, however, at the end of those reductions, we were still not within the tax cap. Um, and that was when the selectmen, uh, we made some reductions to health care and asked the selectmen if they would go back and take a look at health care costs. Um, as I said previously, they were able to renegotiate and come in with a, a much lower health care plan, um, thanks to our, our unions in uh, our community. And uh, those uh, uh, health care costs remain uh, flat. Um, the final uh, changes did result in a, a recommended budget, um, which is what you see on the ballot. And that at, and it actually ended up being $75,000 less than the tax cap. And it's a little over $102,000 more than the default budget. When we looked at the Warren articles, we made some decisions on which Warren articles to support and which Warren articles not to support. Um, together, those Warren articles bring us to, um, still we were $21,000 below the tax cap. Uh, the Budget Committee's proposed budget will bring uh, a seven cent increase per thousand dollars on the tax rate, and that will be a 1.7% increase on the tax rate. Uh, this is an eye chart, uh, but this just shows, just, just takes you through the calculation of how the tax cap is determined. Um, it's based on what the state determines our total valuation was uh, in October when the tax rate was set, and then there's a calculation that brings us to where we are um, with the final outcome of the budget. The tax impact of the Warren articles. And based on the Budget Committee's proposed uh, um, budget, uh, it will be $39 estimated increase to a house valued at $300,000, which is what we're told is the medium house uh, valuation in Litchfield. It will be a $59 estimated increase to a house valued at $450,000. The, the Warren article we did not recommend, and we did not recommend it simply because it would have brought us over the tax cap, and we cannot recommend anything that will bring it over the tax cap. Uh, would have been an additional 22 cents, and that 35 cent increase would be $105 on a $300,000 valuation valued house, and $158 on a house valued at $450,000. We'll take any questions or comments. Discussion. Ralph Bohm, 6 Gibson Drive. First, I'd like to congratulate the selectmen on coming in a correct, with a good default budget. Default budgets are 
not reviewed by anybody other than the governing body. Even the Department of Revenue Administration would get to copy, but they have no review. So the governing body can make it anything they want, but I congratulate the selectmen for coming in with the correct default budget. On the legal fees on the water problem we have with St. St. Germain, shouldn't we be getting some of that money back? Maybe legal or selectmen can answer that. Uh, I can tell you what we were told, which is that they do hope, that is part of the negotiation, that they do hope, um, both looking at the cost of the increased cost of the fire hydrants and our legal fees, that is something they, that is part of the negotiation. Further discussion on Article 5, the operating budget. Uh, Bill Spencer, Cranberry Lane. I'd like to echo Mr. Bowman's comments on the default budget. Congratulations to the selectmen doing the job you were supposed to do, and especially to the Budget Committee for doing a very difficult job of bringing the budget in under the tax cap. Congratulations. Thank you. Further discussion on Article 5? Okay, you'll find it on the ballot as written. So now we're going to go discuss Article 13, Disposal of the Fire Station Building. To see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to demolish or transfer ownership of the Fire Station Building located at 257 Charles Bancroft Highway. This article is contingent on an affirmative vote of Article 4, which approves funding for the construction of a new Fire Station Building. Should Article 4 fail, this article shall be null and void. This is not recommended by the Board of Selectmen 230. Good morning. Mr. Brunel is going to talk about this one. Good morning. So Article 13 was brought forward based on uh, public input we received during the bond hearing that we held in January. Um, the Board of Selectmen at this point does not support it, as we feel it's kind of too early in the process to actually recommend or understand what we're actually going to do in the long term. A little history about the building. The original fire department was built in 1957. It was mainly built by um, labor from volunteer firefighters and material and costs that came from those firefighters. There were additions added to the building in 1960 and 1970, and there's been no real major work done to the building since, the 70, since 1979. In January, uh, July of 2016, we paneled a uh, feasibility study to understand what we can and cannot do to the building to help us understand what the needs were of the department. Um, the building itself had multiple, built, multiple life and safety issues. Um, it has egress problems on both the first and second floor, and it has many structural issues. Um, in addition, the building also has asbestos. Um, all those things would have to be corrected before we can do anything with that building, except if we were going to use it for cold storage. This is a reference. The site is, consists of about a little two acres, and it's shared um, by the church, by the uh, historical society, and um, the cable committee. It's also the location that we do our Memorial Day Parade and event at. And also the zoning of that area is, is residential and um, agricultural. We have talked about certain things we can do with the building. Um, obviously the, build, we, the town is struggling with storage space, so cold storage is one option. We talked about food pantry, we've talked about a bunch of these things here with no real decisions at this point. If we were to sell, uh, you know, if we were to sell the, sell the building, options would be to transfer the ownership to these different, these different entities. Um, today, the building costs us about $13,000 a year to run. That's the building, not the operations side, but the building itself. If we were to convert it over to storage, you know, we estimate about $3,000, $4,000. Again, no decisions have been made. It's kind of too early in our process. We have a fire station to potentially build, and then we need to reevaluate what our real needs are. That's it. I'll take any questions. Further discussion on Article 13. Mr. Lambert. Good morning, George. Thank you, thank you sir. I'm George Lambert, Freelance in Lane and Litchfield. I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing that by now, but and I apologize, but it's the procedure. I have this really interesting chart right here in my packet. I'm suspecting some of the rest of you have it over here. It's the Litchfield, New Hampshire Planning Board 2018 town meeting draft of Litchfield demolition review process flowchart. <laughs> and
And if you follow the flowchart from start to building and inspection, code enforcement, structure greater than or equal to 500 feet built prior to 1960, Next question is, yes, the owner was notified. Who really cares? It's the Board of Selectmen. But the question to the right, determine if the structure is safe or unsafe. Now, I'm not the brightest bulb in the Christmas tree, but the person who has to tell us whether the building is safe or unsafe is the fire chief. So and I've heard his opinion. When who, I was I'm here. sorry, is who? The fire, the fire chief. chief. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the question? I'm getting there. It's long. The fire chief told us that the building had asbestos, was a hazard and a risk, so they want a new building. I got that. And I think they should have it if the voters so agree. We have a checklist here that says it's unsafe. Now, the guy who has to make the decision has already told us it's unsafe as justification for the next Warren article. Why is it that the Board of Selectmen is not actually looking at the other flowchart we have right here and saying that this building is a liability, a long-term liability to the taxpayers in this town simply for the fact it contains asbestos, never mind any of the other things they said was wrong? Why is it the Board of Selectmen did not say, yes, if you have a better plan, you can go back and put another Warren article in front of the voters before the building is destroyed and give us a better plan. But right now, this actually says to the voters, we're going to be accountable. What is the rationale behind the decision of the Board of Selectmen not to support this? I think the rationale is just what you described. We don't know what we want to do with that building at this point in time. We have a building to build. It's going to take us several years. We would like a little bit of time to understand what our options are, and we don't have that time right now. So cool. you, you, your results may be in fact, we may demolition the building because it's too costly to do anything to it. If we can't make it safe for cold storage, it's too costly. We may come forward and do that. We're asking the voters for what they want us to do. Yep. Thank you. So nobody can, it's a follow-up, there's a request for a follow-up. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, it was not meant in a defensive way Speed anyway. Speed me up? <laughs> no, it is, yeah, may I have a follow-up question? George, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> As opposed to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I did not mean to offend. You're not offended. Really? Me, really? Chris knows I got a thick skin, so we're, we're good to go. go. Hey, I like you. You know yeah. I like you. Yeah. But no body can bind a future body as the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. or as the legislative bo of the voting body of the town. So if we decide this year, say yes we're going to remove it and you come up with a better plan before the time that the fire station is done you can come back to the body and say we have a better plan in the meantime we get to say to the voters we're paying attention to your opinion that you expressed at deliberative session or at um, uh, the hearing and you're saying we are, unless we have a better plan, going to get rid of this structure as justification for passing a fire station. Now, I would like a new fire station. Oh, I'm probably not supposed to say that. But you know what? I w have been wanting one since I was on the board the first time. Mm -hmm. But we have not been able to convince the voters. Now, we have to convince the voters at 60%, which is not just a simple majority, that this is the right thing and we've thought it through. If we pass this Warren article, then we are telling the voters we are behaving responsibly with their property. Now, I, you know, I asked for this at that session with some other people, mm -hmm. and I would like the Board of Selectmen to really carefully evaluate the message they are sending to the voters and reconsider their recommendation vote. Will the Board of Selectmen evaluate what some of these thoughts that you get from me and other people and reconsider your recommendation on this particular item. You asking me if we're going to reconsider? Yeah. I'm one person and I'm not going to reconsider. Okay. Mr. Picascucci. 
Chris Pascucci, 12 Colonial. Uh, this, so uh, Mr. Brunel, you're right. We did speak about this at the hearing um, because I, I believe if we didn't speak about this, this warrant wouldn't have even been here. Mm -hmm. However, I believe we spoke to go even one step further. At least I know I did and some others did and others have expressed the interest that the vote to vote uh, uh, to approve a new fire station this should be in there. So it's by default. You vote for a new fire station when it's built. Shortly thereafter, this is knocked down. And like Mr. Uh, Lambert just brought up, then the onus is on the people that want more stuff or want to keep it or want to spend money to come forward and affirmatively vote to do something with it, knowing there's a deadline that a wrecking ball is going to go to that. Now, I know one thing Mr. Lambert said, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear it, this doesn't fall into the Heritage Commission thing because it's a government-owned building. But it doesn't change the point. The point is, this is a separate vote, and most likely, especially given the fact that you guys uh, did not recommend it, this will stay. An asbestos-filled building with structural with poor drainage problems, almost failing septic, structural problems, uh, put up in, in many uh, ways, uh, many different uh, uh, time frames. This will be here, which, which will again ultimately mean it's going to cost us a lot of money moving forward because we already have it. We're going to hear from the selectmen down the road, well, it's an asset, so therefore we have to maintain it. We always hear that. And I agree with it. If you have something, an asset, you should maintain it. That's why I think we should get rid of it. Because unlike what I heard at the last Board of Selectmen meeting where, where a few board members, when they voted against this, they called this thing an asset. In reality, this is not an asset. This is a liability, an asset that is something that has value, at least in the business world. Maybe not in this world. But in the business world, an asset has something value and brings value, and you earn money or, or is worth something. This is, by definition, worth nothing other than cold storage, which a tent could actually provide cold storage. But it's still going to cost a lot of money to maintain it, replace the roof, paint it, get rid of asbestos, everything else. I agree you should change your vote on this, but I really believe this warrant should go and it should be part of the uh, fire station budget to remove this. Thank you. Further discussion on Article 13. Kimberly Queenan from 2 Newstead Street. Um, I, was, I stood up to try to... Um, uh, respond to Mr. Lambert, but the, the gentleman who just went before me corrected what I was going to say anyway. That flowchart that he is looking at are for non-governmental buildings. Whatever the process is today that the Board of Selectment does for government use buildings is what he should be looking at. But I do understand why he's saying asbestos. I get that. Yep. I just wanted that clarified. Thank you. Further discussion on Article 13? No? Alta, do I need to get my, I'm George Lambert. Three George. Three Lambert. George. Sorry. Mr. Lambert. What's that? Mr. Lambert. I just said that. Thank you. The voters are going to have to make a tough decision. 60%. And you know what? When you're sitting there on election night, and you're looking at that vote, and you come one vote short of that 60%, well, I can't actually speak to that. You but can't. I tell you, when I ran for office and lost by one vote, I thought when we don't actually get 60% and don't get a fire station, we are going to leave our fire department employees in the unsafe building we're talking about We're, we're talking about Article 13, George. We're not talking about the other articles just yet. Can we talk about Article 13? Yes. All right. So my follow-up my follow question is to is to you, Mr. Moderator, and that is in the event that we have a discussion on the next article mm -hmm. and that there is a positive and affirmative vote, would an amendment to that article be appropriate and in order without changing its intent because they are connected? And could we then revisit this article and make it advisory so that the public can tell the Board of Selectmen in a non-binding way, what their opinion is, so that the Board of Selectmen... Are you proposing an Article 13 amendment or not? I'm asking whether an amendment to our, the next article would be, if we made an amendment to the next article, can we come back and re-amend this article? I think you can, you can vote to reconsider an article. Great. Unless and somebody would, votes not to. 
Right. You can and see the would a uh, amendment to turn this into an advisory warrant article end up in violation of state law for changing the intent? Because I don't think it does. But I was just asking if that would be appropriate and in order. Could I'm this article be changed to an advisory warrant? Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. That's all I needed to know. That's all I had to ask. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Questions on Article 13. Hi, Nicole Forty, 85 Page Road. Um, have any other, like the church or anyone else in that shared space said they want to use this space or, or weighed in at all? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you. I'll let this he beat you. Phil Reed, Forest Lane. As I read the English language, this article is advisory. Right. It doesn't say they have to sell it or do anything with it. It just says they are authorized to do so if they so wish. It is an advisory article. Right. Good point. Cabin Lynch, 312 Charles Bancroft Highway. It is an advisory article. Thank you. He told okay. your thunder. Um, there is some merit to keep this building, and this, I have to agree with the Board of Selectmen. Write this down, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On this day, Kevin agreed with that. <laughs> um, there is some merit. The building is not as severe as someone may, may think. The oldest section, the 58th second section, has plaster. The only thing problem there is the tile has some asbestos in it and the mask and the vermiculite, which is the insulation type, which all buildings have at this time. Uh, it's encapsulated, okay? It's not a, con con a major concern. Structurally, it's not in bad shape. The rear section is very good. There's a soft section in the middle, which is not a problem. And over the years, there's been some alterations done that should never have been done or built on the second floor. So there are some concerns there. But for the future, the town of Litchfield does need storage. Look a look around. We got a, a closet in the back in which the cable committee is on the second floor, and they're looking for a bathroom, and they have a show there. Okay, these are the things that happen every day. This place has a ba bathroom. We just fixed the leech field loop to get by there. So I think the building has some merit, okay, still. We just got to look at the value of what's going to happen in the future. Just building a fi the firehouse, that's one step. You still got to deal with a lot of other committees and groups that have other functions that we don't have a place for them. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, um, I think Kevin Bernie raises a good good point. The building itself, the bones are fairly okay, right, for the uses we're thinking about. The problem is the current use of the building as a fire station is completely inadequate. Our department needs space. It needs height and clearance and better better um, work area. So that's one of the drivers. Mr. Bohm. Ralph Bohm, 6 Gibson Drive. Question, we've been talking about the firehouse. The, old, the, the, the thing is, it's what constitutes the fire station, who owns the parking lot and has what part of the parking lot? I, I believe the town owns the parking lot. Mr. Lambert. Mr. Monitor, uh, would a motion to amend be in order? Would you like to make a motion, Mr. Lambert? I would yes. like to make a motion to amend Article 13 to delete the word authorize and replace it with the word direct. Then that wouldn't be advisory at this point. You're changing so the you're proposing, I'm, I'm trying to, there it is, uh, to change Article 13 to see if the town will vote to direct the Board of Selectmen to demolish or transfer ownership of the fire station, etc. Do we have a second? We have a second. Further discussion on the motion to change the word from authorized to direct as noted in the article. Mr. Moderator, may I speak to, speak to my motion? First, who seconded it, please? Chris. Okay. Go ahead. If a motion to move it from a directive to an advisory warrant article was actually in order, then the inverse would must must be true, because if changing it in one direction doesn't change the intent neither does changing it in the other. It's a Boolean operation. 
the word doesn't actually change the subject matter. All it does is actually change the implementation. Further discussion on the amended article to, or the proposed amendment to change the word from authorized to direct? Yes, sir. Uh, Jason brought in 23 Aldred Street. I just want to state that I'm completely against changing this warrant article. I think that the existing wording is perfect, and I don't want this to switch to a, you know, mandate to demolish that. I want us to be, the Board of Selectmen, to be able to look at all angles and then figure out what's the best thing to do for the community. So Thank I am you, completely against this. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? I'd like a division vote, sir. I'm sorry, Judge, what? I'm making a request for a division vote. Okay. Division vote. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, that's my call, isn't it? Actually, I have to request it from you, and you have to decide whether or not you want to do it, can we, or can we can actually do a voice vote, and then I can actually say we need a division vote, but then I'll actually switch to a paper vote, and it'll take longer. How about so if I do, a, if I do a, a vote by hand? That'd be fine. Okay. Ma'am, do you have a, discussion, a question or discussion? Gail Barringer, 398 Charles Bancroft Highway. And thank you to these boards for all your hard work. Appreciate it. I'm also against this motion or, or change. And I also wonder why um, there wasn't a consideration of putting in the word lease. Uh, if the building, as uh, Building Inspector Kevin Lynch has just said, um, is fairly uh, usable and safe, um, and the town is looking for revenue, um, the town might consider, if it didn't use it for other events or cold storage, leasing it. Would, would you mind if we, we're going to focus on this, this, mod, this proposed amendment first, then I, we can talk about that option. All right, all right. All right. Yeah. So any further discussion on changing, on the proposed uh, uh, amendment to change the word authorized to direct? Okay, hearing no discussion, can I see, who, uh, can I see a, a, a vote of hands? Uh, all in favor of this proposed amendment, please raise your hand. I see two, George. Do you see any more? Look. You might stand up and look. Okay, uh, those, uh, those, are, those in favor, please raise your hand. Look behind you, George. That's it. Those opposed to this proposed amendment, please raise your hand. George, look, stand up, look. You, you can look. Okay, so, so the proposed amendment fails. <laughs> Okay, so now we're back on the Article 13 as written. And ma'am, if you'd like to make that discussion, just bring it up quickly again, and maybe we can answer the question well, for you. I can probably address it too. I mean, get, yeah. so Gail, I think the, when we say transfer ownership, it's either for sale in or lease long term. Excellent. That's, That's all I wanted idea. to know. Thank you. I missed it. You. Do we have any further discussion on Article 13 as written? Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written then. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now we're off to Article 4. Which is the fire station bond. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $3,750,000 for the purposes of constructing and equipping a new fire station building and to authorize the issuance of not more than $3,750,000 of bonds or notes in accordance with the provisions of the Municipal Finance Act, RSA 33, and to authorize the selectmen to issue and, ne and negotiate such bonds or notes and to determine the rate of interest thereon and the maturity and other terms thereof, and to authorize the selectmen to take any other action relative thereto, a three-fifths vote ballot vote is required, estimated 2018 tax rate impact is $0. This is recommended by, this, by the Selectman uh, 500 and not recommended by the Budget Committee 170. Mr. Burnell, to discuss. No, nope. wrong person. I thought so. I'm we'll just getting this license. Hang on a second. Mr. Lemire, to discuss. That's why he's out there. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, good point. So why don't we talk about this first, I guess. A little bit of a procedural thing we got to deal with, or the correct actually. Let's 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 bring it up and just discuss it. Yeah. And then we can make that motion. Yeah. Okay. okay. What the, the discussion that we're having is that due to the fact that the figure um, in the article has changed since the public hearing, and the vote of the selectmen has changed, the um, we're going to need to take a vote to change that figure here and the budget committee uh, recommendation is going to be removed because they are going to revote after this deliberative session on this article so in the interim article four um, I just wanted to open it and open the discussion with uh, the fact that those of you that may not have been able to see the social media or watch the meeting the last board of selectmen meeting on YouTube um, I just wanted you to know that subsequent to the public hearing uh, we listened we listened to the board uh, we listened to the residents on the cost estimates we listened to all of the input that residents had we convened a meeting uh, the following Monday after the hearing um, of a committee composed of myself selectman John Burnell selectman Kurt Schaefer budget committee vice chair Carrie Douglas fire chief Frank Fretzel Deputy Fire Chief Doug Nickel, Town Administrator Troy Brown, and representatives of the construction management team and architects. We had, an int we had intense three-hour meetings um, on Monday and Friday afternoon of that week, and we were able to come to unanimous consensus on a revised plan and funding. In short, over 20 items were either removed, deferred, or adjusted, including eliminating three officers and one bay to make it a four base station and bring the estimated price tag down to 3.75 million. And I, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the committee for their hard work and their input. At their last meeting, the Board of Selectmen voted five to zero to recommend Article 4 at the 3.75 million figure for today's session. After today's session, the Budget Committee will re-vote on the article because the figure is new. And just note that if the project is approved, it still will have to go out to bid. Personally, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the committee members for the hours they put in and the input offered. It was a classic example about how your elected and appointed officials in Litchfield can work together to produce an outcome that satisfied most, if not all, of the concerns expressed. I'm proud of this effort and the results that uh, were achieved. I'd like to introduce Chief Freitzel. Um, who will begin an update of the pro project um, at this point. Good morning, thank you. Um, with, uh, with us here today are representatives of the uh, construction management and architectural firms and I will uh, be deferring to uh, Preston Hunter from Ekman Construction here to go over some of the cost items when we get to that point. Why is a new station needed? We've done this a number of times and I think based on the fact that we just reversed the, uh, the, the Warren Article uh, 13 or discussed that, um, probably don't need to cover that quite as much. Uh, I do want to spend some time on what changes were made to drop the price of the uh, project. Uh, and then we'll get into project costs. Uh, the town administrator will speak to the financing and the bond amounts. Uh, and then uh, with the moderator's permission, we'll uh, gladly field questions. Uh, obviously the community has changed since uh, this building was originally built. Um, at that time it was mostly just fires. Now it's uh, pretty much all hazards, emergency management. Uh, and EMS, and EMS constitutes about 53% of our current call volume. Um, and, and I think it, it, it speaks to um, something that was pointed out to us in a meeting with a resident uh, over the course of the last two weeks, that in the past 40 years, the town has built a new town hall police station, additions to Griffin Memorial, um, Litchfield Middle School, 
uh, and as well as adding an, a wing to it, built Campbell, a new transfer recycling center, added portable classrooms to the middle and elementary schools, and built a cable building, but not done anything with the fire station. And, and I, that was kind of um, striking when they, when they brought that up, because quite honestly, we really didn't even look at it that way. Again, we've been over how the building was built and so forth. Uh, current um, side views and so forth. Um, we do have equipment that sits outside that this new, ability, this new building would house 90%, uh, 95% of. Um, we, we've already discussed, I think, at, at length the uh, deficiencies that were pointed out in the feasibility study. Um, that was released back in 2016 and then from that just so that everybody's aware from that last year we came before you for a vote uh, to support uh, through uh, impact fees and um, fund balance so it's zero in tax increase to take the set of plans that were done 10 and um, 15 years ago review and revise them to meet current code stand codes and standards as well as make any alterations necessary to be uh, in line with indus current industry best practices in the fire service. Um, from that is the, is the building that we originally presented and, and uh, subsequently I will get into here. Uh, it, it's going to address space and, and uh, needs that we have currently, uh, structural issues, and then again, kind of a timeline. Um, once we received approval on the warrant article, we, we again immediate, we listened to what was dis discussed and debated last year at this very meeting with the need for or the potential for a public safety complex. Uh, we took the time, worked with the, uh, the architects to reposition the building, redo the site plans so that there is the potential to add a police station component to this building. We reconfigured some of the internal um, spaces to allow the common areas or core areas, a kitchen, a training room, and so forth, that they're in that point where both buildings will meet at some point in the future so that they can be shared and not require separate kitchens, separate training rooms, and so, and so forth, it, which is a cost savings to the town. That did take us a little further along than we anticipated and, and kind of why it took further into the year. Um, in July, we, we put out a request for proposals from construction management firms. We received six um, construction management companies expressed interest in submitted proposals. <coughs> Those proposals were reviewed by the ar architectural firm that we've been using for 20 plus years, by myself and the town administrator. They were scored based on a matrix provided to us um, by the, the architectural firm, which has been used multiple times before. From that scoring, we narrowed it down to three and actually added a fourth since we figured we, had, we were going to be spending the better part of a day interviewing companies. Why not do at least four and not just three? We interviewed the top four companies. That committee comprised of both uh, town and department staff as well as representatives of the community. Um, and, and the unanimous, unanimous decision at the end of the day was to proceed with Ekman Construction as the construction manager. They since move, have moved forward, estimated the building, sent their plans out to over 30 uh, subcontractors for pricing. So it's not just their estimate, it is an estimate of um, contractors that are out there. It has not gone to bid. Due to the current economy and the, and the um, work, the, the amount of work that is out there, uh, it was their professional opinion to not bid it back in November, December timeframe for a project that one is not yet approved and two would not probably start uh, break ground until the middle of 2018. They felt it was in the town's best interest to do a, a and they were very comfortable that they could do a very concise estimate based on what the plans, uh, based on the plans and then go out to bid once this is approved in March. Uh, the board agreed with that and that was the direction they took. So it will still go out to bid. The price that, that uh, um, we have is a guaranteed maximum price. It will not exceed that price. Uh, once we, we um, sign the agreement with Ekman, uh, a web informational website was launched, www.litchfieldfirestation.com. 
Um, design updates were completed. Construction costs were estimated in December. They were reviewed, presented to the Budget Committee in uh, early January, uh, presented at the bond hearing, and as you heard Chairman Lemire indicate, based on the feedback we received from that, we have modified the, the scope and size of the, the building to uh, bring it down to a $3.75 million project. Uh, what is being proposed? The new fire station, the, the new station will be located on Liberty Way. It is more geographically centered in town. It is closer to the, the largest uh, or the most densely populated areas of town. Conversely, when the fire station that we are in now was built, that population density was pretty much along the Route 3A or Charles Bancroft corridor. What, what then was forest is now homes. So being closer to those homes is, is twofold. One, it allows our on-call personnel to get to the fire station a little bit quicker because it's closer to where they live. Two, it allows us to get the apparatus to you a little quicker because we'll be closer to where you live. Uh, the revised site plan um, does not do quite as much um, uh, site work. There will be no drive, no rear doors on the apparatus bay for a drive-through um, uh, component to this building. So part of the decreases were in the uh, revised site plans and the need, the, uh, the lack of a need for additional uh, wetlands offsets and detention ponds and so forth. However, it still allows for the future um, addition of a police uh, station component. Revised floor plan, uh, there were handouts, hopefully there were enough uh, out there that everyone has one, but basically the shaded area is the original design, and then the black um, exterior walls, if you will, are the current, so that you can see what amount of space was cut. As was indicated, we've cut back from five bays to four bays, taken off some office space off the back of the building, um, and then shrunk the, the bay area down just slightly. Uh, top picture you see here is the front of the building, which would face Albuquerque Ave. The middle two would be the north and south views. Uh, and then the, the bottom would be the view if you were standing at the front door of Town Hall and looking over towards this proposed building. Okay, project costs for that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Preston Ekman, uh, Preston Hunter from Ekman Construction. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So some of this is already a review of, of the process that the Chief just outlined, but uh, I'll, I'll just touch on it quickly so folks understand uh, at what point Ekman has become involved. Um, shortly after the, uh, uh, the town selected Ekman, we were given a uh, set of documents to price um, from Warren Street Architects and their uh, engineers. Uh, this was uh, issued for pricing in late November. We spent the month of December establishing uh, a cost, as the chief had indicated. There were over 30 qualified subcontractors and suppliers that participated in that pricing exercise. After which, uh, we reviewed those uh, costs with the, with the chief, the town administrator, and ensured that the soft costs uh, that were also necessary to complete the entire project, including furniture, fixtures, equipment, and those items that would be outside of the construction contract, were all accounted for. Uh, and uh, that is how we arrived at the initial cost of 5.5 million. So after uh, th that uh, project was proposed at uh, the uh, budget committee and bond hearing, as was indicated earlier, uh, we were asked to go back uh, to the design and identify areas that could be reduced or eliminated from the project in order to bring the cost down. Um, in that process, we developed over 30 value engineering options and we re reviewed those with uh, officials from the Board of Selectmen, the Budget Committee, the Fire Department, and the Town Administrator. So the end result of that was a revised project uh, cost uh, total, uh, which is $3.75 million. So as I mentioned, the uh, building costs were reduced, uh, but also the soft costs were reduced. And so currently, uh, the, the 3.75 includes about uh, half a million in soft costs. So some of the specifics, 
those may be difficult to read, and I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight uh, some of the, the more important ones. So these are the lists of reductions from the, uh, the, the pricing documents that we received that now are reflected in the $3.75 million project. Um, one of the items that uh, was a, a sort of a low-hanging fruit was replacing uh, 10 folding doors at the apparatus bay with overhead doors. This actually allowed for savings in a number of different ways, including uh, allowed us to reduce the structure, which was supporting these folding doors, um, allowed us to reduce bollards, uh, which were protecting the doors, and ultimately allowed us to save quite a bit of money by going to a more conventional overhead door. Uh, as the chief indicated, the site work was reduced. Um, this eliminated access to the rear of the building. However, the apparatus has the ability to um, uh, enter off of Albuquerque Drive uh, through the front of the, of the station. Uh, we also identified HVAC and plumbing as a major cost driver for this project, and we um, proposed reductions in the HVAC and plumbing systems to uh, provide some savings. Uh, this was previously a five bay station, now it's a four bay station. And we've also uh, made some slight reductions in the overall length of the apparatus bay, which again was possible by uh, eliminating the folding uh, garage doors. Uh, as the chief had indicated, uh, we also deleted three offices and the hallway that connected those offices. Uh, the current design is, is set up so that if in the future uh, the department needs that space, it can be added. Um, we, I mentioned that some of the structural changes that were allowed in the apparatus bay uh, provided some savings as well. Uh, those were formerly concrete, what they call concrete portal walls, uh, which went uh, about 16 feet high. Uh, that, that was um, uh, an expensive uh, structural approach and we're able to to work with the structural engineer to come up with uh, a more cost-effective approach there. Electrical reductions were also part of the savings. Um, we eliminated uh, lighting controls and um, a number of other uh, simplified systems. Uh, this previous design had a radiant concrete apron in the front of the station that's been eliminated. Um, the uh, gear storage room has been resized in order to fit within the, the building footprint without uh, requiring additional space. And in the back of the, um, uh, of, of the apparatus bay area, we have uh, decided to frame in uh, what will be, uh, what can be future garage door open, openings if in fact uh, uh, the future phase is completed and uh, access is provided by the site uh, to the back. Um, you won't have to redo the structure of the building. Uh, there are essentially knockouts there that can uh, accommodate future garage doors, but currently they're not part of the, de the, uh, the design. And a lot of these other items are smaller items. Uh, I think the point is that we really scrubbed the design and have, um, have uh, done uh, quite a bit of work in order to bring the cost down. So I mentioned uh, that there's the construction costs, which were the, those are some of the reductions that I just reviewed. In addition to that, there are owner soft cost items. This is just a list of what those owner soft cost items include. I don't. I think if there are any specific questions, the chief can, can speak to those, but uh, that includes mo moving some of their larger existing equipment. There's a vehicle exhaust system, which is required uh, to, um, uh, in the apparatus bay. Uh, we have furniture, fur fixtures, and equipment included, um, communications for the station, and other uh, miscellaneous items. So at the bond hearing, uh, we were asked to go out and do some research and look at uh, what other stations cost in the state. Um, uh, as I had indicated at that meeting, the cost per square foot uh, analysis can be a little bit deceiving because every project is different. Um, but what we've done, and I realize that fund is very small because we have about 20 different stations that we're looking at here. Uh, the green stations are new construction stations. The light blue colored stations are additions and renovations. And the, um, the cost per square, this is total project cost per square foot, and these other stations, the, the costs have been um, 
found through newspaper articles or other information that's available on the web. So just to give you a sense, um, the, on the high side uh, is the Nashua substation, which I believe is also on a Warren article. Oh, actually, they don't do Warren articles in Nashua, it's a city. Uh, so that's a, that's a current uh, project at uh, just south of $500 a square foot, all the way down to on the low end, uh, Farmington Public Sta Safety Station, which is around $134 a square foot. All of these costs have been adjusted to $2,018, so we can try to do a fair comparison. I think the takeaway here is that the red line is the uh, proposed cost for the Litchfield Fire Station, which falls uh, in line with many other stations that are of similar size and type. So we took this analysis one step farther and looked specifically at the construction cost of the building. And what you see on the screen now are uh, stations that Ekman Construction has built or is, has budgeted. Um, and uh, we have both, we're showing both building a cost per square foot and the site cost per square foot. So the smaller bars in orange represent the site cost per square foot, which you can see varies wildly from $53 a square foot of the Hampton Fire uh, Beach Station all the way down to $25 a square or $16 a square foot at the Hampton Fire um, headquarters, which was an addition in renovations. So once again, the light colored uh, large bars are additions and renovations project. The dark colored, uh, dark blue colored bars are uh, new construction. So this again confirms the Litchfield uh, project cost uh, specific to the construction cost is in line uh, somewhat in the middle of this uh, sample of about uh, six or eight, about eight stations there. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Brown to talk about the tax impact. Okay, so if the article passes, obviously we're going to need to pay for uh, the project. The Board of Selectmen has been working with the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank and looking into what the cost would be to finance the project. Um, so what we looked at was um, various loan um, structures. The Board recently decided that they would uh, recommend a 20-year bond. It would be a level debt bond payment, so the, the bond payment on an annual basis would be pretty much a fixed amount <clears throat> that would be, uh, uh, the purpose of that would really be to stabilize the operating budget. The uh, cost to the homeowner would be in the first year uh, with an average home value of $300,000, $90 per year, about 25 cents um, a day. I think I worked it out to be about $7.50 uh, per month, something like that. So. Um, these are all estimates at this point in time, uh, working you know, with an estimated interest rate at 3.25%, um, depending on when the project is actually bid, and we know the exact guaranteed maximum price and the timing of the sale of the bond. We may be, you know, the bond um, article obviously would be, uh, the amount of debt would be reduced to the guaranteed maximum price. That would be a good thing and the cost to the homeowner would uh, obviously be decreased. Discussion on Article 4. This is the question mainly for the bud Budget Committee. Will this increase come under the tax cap? <laughs> This year, there is no impact on the budget. It'll have to depend on next year in the fall. Uh, there's a variety of, it's dependent on what the tax rate is set at. Um, I can't say that it will or it won't. It, it, it should, but I can't say that it will or it won't. For the budget committee to recommend it, it would have to be. Further discussion, Article 4. Mr. Reed. Phil Reed, Forest Lane. I rise to speak in favor of this bond issue. 
I thought long and hard about it. You know, we uh, like to talk about how grateful we are to our first responders and how wonderful they are and their families. These people who come to work every day and their families aren't sure whether they're going to come back in one piece or not, and if at all. And we spout off at the mouth about how wonderful that is. But for years now, we've been sending our first responders to work in a dangerous environment before they even get on the fire truck. And frankly, I find that a little bit immoral. I think this town owes it to the people who lay their lives on the line every day for us to provide them with a safe place to work. And we haven't got time or the money to procrastinate any longer about it. Because the more we procrastinate, the more the price goes up. This building is not too different from what was proposed 10 years ago, and yet it's several more dollars, million more dollars expensive. And that trend isn't about to stop. So I think we need to move forward to this. We owe it to our first responders. We owe it to ourselves. Let's do it. Thank you, Phil. Mr. George Lambert, 3 Lidston Lane in Litchfield. I have been in support of this idea for a long time, and I would like to thank everyone who has put so much effort into doing it and into reducing the numbers. But I have a question. How many times did we respond to a fire last year? An actual building? I mean, we break yeah. it down by building fires off top of my head. You can, build, you can combine building forest, anything. You, you can include campfires if you want. How many, how many times did we put the people Phil is talking about in a dangerous situation? I would argue 653 times. Well. Because every, every time we go out, there's an unknown. I mean, it's not just building fires anymore. It's, you know, we, we have dealt with, albeit not probably well known, a number of uh, opioid issues and the, the hazards that come with that. So, and, and even, you know, a routine fire alarm can turn out to be something significant. So I would argue that every time the men and women of the fire department respond to a call, there's some level of hazard. To Excellent. Them. Thank you very much. And I completely agree. We need a new fire station. When I was a selectman more than 20 some years ago, we needed a fire station. And we had one proposed then. So let's do one this time. Yep. Further discussion on Article 4. Mr. Lasalas. Yes, uh, this is a big deal. I'd just like to start by um, s saying a thank you to those folks, and I know there are people in the audience who had relatives who were involved in building the fire station the, that has served the town for 60 years. So I'd like to thank those of you who have relatives that were involved, or if possibly you were, that the town has gotten so much use over the years by these volunteers who did it the old way. Um, I don't think there's any question in our mind, in the majority of the people in town, that we need a new fire station. Um, I certainly am one of those people. The decisions that you make with respect to the station, uh, certainly the cost is uh, something that has, has to be weighed. Um, some of us here were very involved in this particular building. And we had to make a lot of decisions on what to put in the building. 
or what not to put in the building because you have to weigh things. We have some very frugal people in town, rightfully so, and you have, you have to make decisions based on the cost, but also the value that you get. This room that we're sitting in did not have to be here, this auditorium. There were those, Cindy, who would, who would have said and did at the time that Litchfield did not need an auditorium. Bill Spencer was certainly involved in that. There were countless dozens of decisions on what needed to go into this building and what we could do without. Now we made the decision to have an auditorium. It cost quite a bit of money to have this auditorium. Uh, it cost almost $12 million for Campbell to be built. But every time I walk into this building, I'm very proud of what we did. Um, and it has served us very well. Now, as far as the cost and the value that, that we get from it, that's a decision that each and every taxpayer has to make. Um, I, I think the, we are served by our fire department that I, I'm very proud of the, of the work that each and every fireman does. And I can't imagine a town our size having any better fire department than we have. Um, but I, I think whenever you go into the ballot box and, and cast your ballot, you're going to have to make that decision. Certainly taxes are an impact. Uh, this, this new figure is certainly better than the old figure. Um, but that's what each and every person have to, has to decide. Thank you. Rich, just be aware of your shoelace so we can see you try. Yeah. Further discussion on Article 4? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Nicole Forty, eighty-five, Peach. Um, I just had a question. When they put up like the tax impact, I know at the bond um, at the hearing on the eleventh, there were a lot of different options as far as like the type of bond and if it would be a greater impact at first. So, is the decision that was just shown what it would be, what we would be voting on? Like, has that determination been made? After the public hearing, the board discussed the six different scenarios, and at that point in time, the board decided that the 20-year uh, payment, uh, they, were, they were looking at trying to get the tax impact at right around $100. And at the time, based on what we know, the estimated cost of the building, estimated interest rates, we felt that that was the, the best note to go with. As we get further down in this process, if the article passes, we'll continue to work with the bond bank and their advisors, and the board may reconsider that decision based on what the financials um, indicate at that time. Um, so, but the authority rests with the board of selectmen to, to negotiate those notes. Thank you. Mr. Spencer. Oh. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, First of all, Bill Spencer, uh, I'm in favor of the fire station, uh, but I have a question as far as the annual payment on this. The first year we actually have to pay out, what is it? How much we have to pay? The first, the first year's payment is about $267,000. Okay. Now, here's my point. I'm a voter. I'm looking at an article that says, Wow, 3.7 million. But I have no idea what it's going to cost me. Now, if this article, and I think we've done this in the past, were to say year 2018, $0, 2019, $250,000, I think it gives it a better tone in terms of what this cost is going to be 
unless the voter understand that they're not voting on $3 million, they're voting on $200 and some odd thousand dollars in the future. And it would make it much easier for a voter to see what they're voting on and perhaps get this to pass. Now, I am not going to make an amendment to this, but I would suggest that you folks up there ought to think about it before this closes and amend this article to show what the cost is going to be potentially this year and next year. Kind of like what you see in Article 8. I'm sorry? Kind of like what you see in Article 8, yes. which is the year-over-year -year cost for the plow. Look at Article 8. It's what a, am you, I missing? Looking at, look at Article 8. Just look at the way the layout of the, of the, the cost. Yeah. 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 But not necessarily all the way out. Yeah. I mean, that's, a diff that's a lease, so that's yeah. a different situation. Yeah. But I think it's appropriate, and you can do Great. it. Yep. Mr. Moderate? Um, yes, sir. Bill, it's an excellent point. The only reason why we didn't and we can't is because these costs are unknown at this point. And uh, since the, the project hasn't even been approved, it hasn't gone to bid, and the, the bond bank, we're going to continue negotiations with the bond bank, putting an amount in the Warren article would tie us into that amount. If we can find an amount smaller for the taxpayer, that's what we're going to try to do. So putting it into that Warren article the way warrants are worded now, we didn't want to tie us into it in case we can get a lower amount. Is that true? Yes. For future costs? That's the lawyer tells you that, that is actually that's true? That's the, the guidance that we got. Yeah, I, I would be concerned with bond council when you go to package this uh, into uh, the sale of a bond. And we well, start disclosing certain numbers in the article that the voters approve. But what we're talking about here is not authorizing that expenditure. It is saying estimated cost for the next two years. Estimated cost, not appropriated cost. You know, what you're appropriating is the bond. I don't what you're doing, see what why you can't do that as an advisory part of the one article. It's been done in the past. I can tell you that based on the 20-year note that we we're discussing right now, it's that limited payment. So it's a fixed amount. Um, it does adjust a little bit with interest. We're looking at a range of somewhere from 260 a year up to like 267, 268 a year. But am I incorrect that you are not authorizing that? But rather, if you say it is an estimated we could, cost, we could put I'm not looking at the lawyer right now. Yeah. We could put estimates. I'd advise you to do it, honestly. It makes it easier for me to make a decision. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Mark Petrin, Newstead Street. So this is the cost of the new building. Um, I'm imagining there's going to be additional costs for additional equipment like new like how many fire trucks do we have now? We plan to add any more EMT vehicles, et cetera. Because that, that would be good to have that broken out as well, since there'll be contingent cost after the initial cost. Chief? So there'd be no new addition of apparatus. Um, the town does need to look at its apparatus replacement program, as most of the apparatus is over 15 years old now. But there's no intent, no plans currently or in the foreseeable future for additional apparatus other than replacement or 24-hour coverage. Thanks. Carrie Douglas, Vice Chair of the Budget Committee. I have been very much inter involved in this la latest round of this. And I'm pretty sure not too many people in town are going to accuse me of being a huge spender. So the fact that I'm behind this really means that I believe it in it. Um, as we've seen um, through the cost of the past decade or so, the costs are going to continue to go up. There's no, not much argument that this is needed. The, question, the biggest argument we see in town is how much are we willing to pay? So I would encourage people to think about it. Are we, if we believe that this is something that is needed, and it's needed badly enough that we've been talking about it for a couple of decades, at some point we need to decide that we're going to, we're going to build it because it's only going to cost more in the future. If I'm going to spend the money, I'd rather spend it now than spend more in the future. It's more responsible to handle, it's more cost effective, it's more fiscally conservative to address the issue now while it costs less. And for those who are concerned about um, a fire safety complex, 
I mean, voting yes on this allows that complex to eventually come into fruition. Doing it in phases will be more cost effective overall. If we're trying to keep the cost impact approximately $100, this allows that first step. And then the next step will come along to allow us to eventually get there. But to get there all at once might turn people off. So let's do it in phases so it can get done. Secondly, um, for the people who are concerned about the lack of ambulance, well, we can't really house one in our current facility. So if we want, if there are people in town who are considering voting against this for lack of ambulance, well, if you want to see an ambulance in the future, we need a new building. So let's, let's build it now while it costs less, while it's responsible, and so we can move on to the next discussion in town. So again, not a big spender, but I'm definitely behind this one. Thank you. Susan Seabrook, 33, James Way Drive. <coughs> I would like to agree with Mr. Spencer, but I don't see an amendment forming right now, and my understanding it has to be done today. I am not proposing an amendment to have estimated costs, but I would like that done today. My financial background is not adequate to put a proposal there, but our budget committee certainly could do that, please. What, what I'm going to suggest, and, and I'll see if it uh, works for you, the Board of Selectmen prepares an explanatory sheet that goes out in the Hudson Litchfield News um, before voting. It explains every Warren article. Um, by the time we put this together, would it be okay with you if we put in the ex explanation under the Warren article um, the, bond, the bond costs that we we're able to negotiate at that point? Or do you prefer to have it in the article? I would prefer to have it in the article today so that we can sell this to our town with an understanding of what the cost will be. I think if you put the estimate there, it will be perceived by this town much better. We need a fire station here. I am in full support of this, but we need to sell it to the town. And the school deliberative session is next week, and we have items on there that are going to cost money. So, Bill Spencer, I leave it to you. She basically said what I was going to say, Brent. Uh, my daughter gets the HLN. She never reads it. Oh. Okay? You go in the voting booth, you've got it right in front of you, you see it right there. If you're going to do it, you want to do it today at the deliberative session with an amendment made by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Thank you. We have to amend. We have to amend the amount anyway. We have to amend the amount to show the new 3.7 million. So let's work on something. If you give us a second. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. Uh, while we're doing that, um, I just found out officially one of our members is not returning. Um, this gentleman has served the town uh, for several years in different capacities. He's worked with the Recreation Commission, the Planning Board. And he's been on the board of selectmen. I don't have the exact amount of, of years, but he's uh, been a source of, um, of great support. Um, he's a tremendous custodian of your dollar. Um, he's not afraid to offer his input, and the, his job and family commitments has um, caused him not to be able to run again. I would like and ask all of you in the room to give Steve Perry a round of applause for the years that he served as a selectman in town. I just want to say thank you. Um, seven years I've served as a selectman to this town and for the taxpayers and all I tried to do was the best I could. A lot of people don't agree with what I say. A lot of times I can persuade people to think the way I think. Sometimes it's just good arguments or I could usually say common sense. But thank you very much. Phil Reed, I'd just like to make one more comment. I think much of our discussion in this room this morning has been like preaching to the choir. Yeah. Our big problem is it takes 60% of the voters to get this approved. We have a challenge. 
to make sure that our friends and neighbors get out and vote and support this. Getting that supermajority is not easy, and it's up to us to do everything in our power to get our friends and neighbors out to vote in support of this thing. We owe it to our first responders to do it. Okay, um, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to uh, make an amendment to Article 4. Um, that it, it, Article 4 showed up as 5.5 million at the public hearing. I'd like to amend it to, to reflect the, the new cost of 3.750 million and also add in with estimated bond costs for 2019 of $267,370. 2020, 257,488. 2021, 257,938 dollars, shown as estimated bond costs. Give me a second. Also, 2018, zero. O okay, fine. Yes. Up, fine. showing 2018, zero. Okay, so the first part of your comment, the the original bond, the original bond value doesn't matter here because it's not on the on the current warrant, right? It's just the estimated values you want to see added to the bottom. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Except the budget committee is recognized that it changed. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So I, I moved that. Okay. Right. Second. Right. We have a second. Second. I, I got to see it. I gotta, can you give it to me? I got to reread it because I didn't capture your numbers. <laughs> yeah, so excellent. Remember this about the board. Okay, so we have a proposed amendment. And I just want to clarify, whatever was presented at the hearing, that is the number that has to go forward to deliberative session. So technically, the article still stands at 5.5 million, which is why the amendment includes now the new wording and the new amount. So I want to make that clarification of why we also needed to make sure that number is changed. Okay. So what I've got written here is an amendment that's misread, miswritten. Yes. It, shouldn't, it shouldn't have been written as 3-7. It should be 5 million still. Right. right. And that you're changing it. Now you're amending it back to 3-7. The, the one I was submitted to, to discuss tonight, the current warrant reads 3750. And that And that is incorrect. The current okay. warrant stands at 5.5 million. This amendment is needed to change it to the 375. I, I understand what you're doing. I just, I, I just acknowledge that this is in, this is not written right. It was changed before the board recommended the change. I believe it's written correctly. Okay. Board of Selectmen's warrant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Get it on the table here. That's all. So it's going to go on the ballot. The budget committee, they had to take a vote and a recommendation, and they recommended on a 5.5. Right, so there should be nothing because you're not warned and voted on. Right. It just says zero. There. So zero. No right, so that's why you have to revote. Yeah. So the amendment tonight is just the estimated costs across the years. Why don't we work with that? Fine. Okay. So the proposed amendment to Article 4, as written in your handout, simply adds a table that shows the estimated impact, just like it does now, for 2018 of zero dollars, but also adds three lines, the estimated impact, 2019 impacts of, of, of 267370, the estimated impact of 2020 of 257488, and the estimated impact of 2021 of 257938. We had a seconded. Who seconded it? Uh, Bill Spencer seconded it. Further discussion on the proposed amendment. Mr. Reed. I think we might be creating some confusion here. No kidding. Because all your other warrant articles, you say estimated tax rate impact. 
And what you're talking about is mm. putting on the exonated total bill, mm. Good point. which doesn't do much for the homeowner as identifying what it's going to cost him. So I would suggest, if you can, translate this per thousand, two hundred thousand, yeah, down to what the rate impact is on my homeowner tax bill. And you know what else is deceiving too is that when it's not a cumulative amount. It's only, when we go two hundred thousand a year. It's not an additional two hundred thousand. It's matter of fact, the cost in the second year is reduced. So the impact is not like 400,000 in the second year and 600,000 in the third year. That's deceiving to me. You know, people may think that every year we get 200,000 more, and that's not the case. So we have a proposed amendment that it sounds like we don't want to float. Well, first Discussion of all, I'd, on the I'd, proposed I'd, amendment. I'd like to address uh, Mr. Reed's comment. Uh, I don't think it's possible to put an estimated tax impact uh, in future years because you have no idea what the revenues or any of the other things are the tax base going to be. So you can't do that. So all that I was proposing, and we've done this in the past, is say here's what you ex expect to have to pay out of your budget. It has to be in the budget for this bond issue next year and the following year and the following year. That's, we've done that in the past. Just like, as you said in the other article, we've done that for the other uh, lease. Here's what we're going to pay each year for this. And I don't think it's unreasonable to have it in there. We have it as an estimated cost, not tax impact, estimated cost. And it tells the voters it's insignificant in terms of the total budget if you pass this article. So let's get this off the table. The proposed amendment is to add this, these three bullets. 267,000 for 2019, 2020, 2021. Do we have any further discussion on the proposed amendment to add these three bullets? Sir? Not for me. Okay. Uh, William Barrett, 53 Pilgrim Drive. Uh, I don't think the issue is really adding that kind of breakdown language necessary. We have the, the main figure, 3.75 million. What we need is the time estimate of how long it's going to take us to put pay that off like a, like a mortgage, like 20 years. If we have a 20-year element in that language, then we will know it will take us 20 years to pay off 3.75 million. So I don't think you need a specific tax rate impact or, you know, the, the per year outlay of cash. I mean, it, it's a mortgage payment. I mean, we as homeowners, we understand that. When I bought my house, I, I know what my total was and I know how long I have to pay it. So. You just need the time element in there 20 years. Further discussion on the article of the proposed amendment to add these three bullets? Hearing none, let's take a vote. All in favor of adding these three bullets to the existing Warren article, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. Uh, those say, for those of you saying aye, please raise your hands. Say aye. Those opposed say no. Or right, raise your hand now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. So the nays have it. The proposed amendment fails. We're back to the original article as written. Further discussion on Article 4 as written. Yes, sir. So we're all set. It's 3.75. Okay. 
Sure, we can make a motion to affirm the number. Just have it in the record. Okay. Sure. I'll move. I'll move to affirm the number at three point seven five million for our second. Wait a second. Okay, we have a motion to affirm the number three million seven hundred and fifty thousand. Um, for Article 4. It, Discussion. It, in, in this is um, at the request of the Budget Committee Chair, and it's only to make sure that uh, we don't run into any legal yeah. issues down the road, and, and I'm okay with that. Further discussion on the affirmation? Oh, we had a second it already. Susan Seabrook, 33 James Wade. Does that change the numbers for the selectmen no. and the budget no. committee? Thank no. you. No. Yes. yes. Oh, budget committee. Yes. <laughs> the 170 vote that is up there was on the $5.5 million um, warrant. The budget committee will be meeting after this session to vote on the 3750. And will that vote then appear on the ballot? Whatever the vote is this afternoon will appear on the ballot. Okay. Yeah, because that's not part of the warrant. That's just a recognition of the warrant. Okay, gotcha. Further discussion on Article 4 as written. John Travis, Two Sets of Street. Uh, wondering if it's appropriate to make a motion to restrict reconsideration of this article? Uh, we haven't finished okay. discussing it, but yes, it is after the fact. Further discussion on Article 4? Anybody? Okay, you'll find it on the ballot as written. I'd like to make a motion to restrict reconsideration of this Article 4. Do we have a second? Um, we didn't vote on the motion to affirm the 375. Oh, that's right, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you trying to rush it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a, a motion to affirm the, 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 the number. $3,750,000 on Article 4. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Okay, we're affirmed. Now you can reconstruct reconsideration. I'd like to make a motion to restrict reconsideration on Article 4. Do we have a second? All in favor of reconsidering, re, re, restricting reconsideration on Article 4, please say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Eyes have it. Okay, we, four is, is, we can no longer speak of Article 4. All right. Article 6. Full-time police officer to see the town will vote to hire a full-time police officer effective July 1, 2018 and vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $40,899 for wages and benefits for the period of July 1, 2018 to December 31, 2018, estimated 2018 tax rate impact of five cents. Um, all kinds of wage breakdowns. This is recommended by the Selectman 500 and recommended by the Budget Committee 600. Chief O'Brien to speak to it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Captain Benjamin Sargent on behalf of Chief Joseph O'Brien, I'm pleased to speak before you today. Um, we're here before you to ask you to support the warrant article for an additional full-time police officer. And you may ask, how did we come to this point to, uh, that we would ask for an additional police officer? And this actually has been a process over the past 10 years. In January of 2008, the Municipal Resources Incorporated conduct, conducted a complete evaluation of our police department, its staffing levels, its calls for service, investigative times. And the numbers that they used in the time period that they reviewed was 2007 and 2008. This independent and professional organization determined that we were grossly understaffed. Part of their recommendation to work towards correcting this deficiency was to phase in new police officers over several years. One of their concerns uh, in needing additional officers came down to safety, the safety of the public and the safety of the police officers who serve you. With the approval of this warrant article, 
this additional officer would complete the recommendation for the number of police officers for the police department. Chief O'Brien and I have reviewed uh, our calls for service in the recent years. Uh, we've reviewed the investigative times that's required for us to uh, best serve you. And we feel confident that we could say, if this officer were to be approved, that there would be no new patrol positions in the foreseeable future. I think it's important to share with you that we've recognized four benefits to the agency and to the town as a whole. First and foremost, we will have complete two-man, 24-hour coverage. When we come down to safety, this is what it's all about. It keeps the officers safe. It allows them to work together and to come and better, better serve the community. <coughs> there will be a substantial, and please let me reiterate, a substantial cut in our overtime. And I think it's important to recognize that we made this investment to hire this company to make this assessment. And when we meet that final recommendation to get to the 13th officer, <coughs> We've, we've achieved that level. We, we, we took on this, this uh, organization to assess. It was money well spent, and now we're meeting the final recommendations. The chief and I would like to share with you that an additional officer would essentially become cost neutral, and we can get into that shortly. Chief O'Brien and I are confident that this position will save a minimum of $65,000 in current overtime and benefit cost. The way that we're able to accomplish this is by recognizing where we would routinely fill overlapping shifts with overtime, we don't have to. We evaluated our schedule and how we can apply this new officer will have a substantial cut in the overtime. And keep in mind too, this officer will be able to cover vacation time when officers are away, whether they're sick or on holiday or away at training. So let's talk about some cost-effective savings. In 2018, this Warren article would cost $40,899. Following year, this new officer would cost $89,512. Now let's tie in that $65,000 minimum savings. The estimated cost for this officer is then $24,512. And that's with that minimum savings at 65000 And the chief and I look to increase that savings. The ultimate goal is to make this position cost neutral. And again, uh, as the moderator had explained, uh, the Board of Selectmen unanimously supported this. The Budget Committee, committee unanimously supported this. And personally, on behalf of Chief O'Brien, the uh, members of the Litchfield Police Department, we'd like to thank the Board of Selectmen the Budget Committee for your continued support, and thank you for the townspeople for listening, and thank you for your support. And if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Further discussion, Article 6. Uh, I'm just a little curious about the savings. Uh, do we have any savings in 2018? So the savings would be more minimal in 2018 only because we would have to bring in the new officer and train that officer. We could uh, benefit from a certified police officer coming who would only have to do an in-house training, which could approximately be 10 to 14 weeks. But if this was a brand new police officer that would need to go through our in-house field training program and then go to the police academy, no, you would not see those direct uh, savings immediately. When that officer is up and running full time and on his own, that's where you will see those immediate savings. Uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, what's the overtime budget for this coming year? Uh, what I could tell you is, uh, in terms of the exact overtime budget for this year, I'm not 100% not sure. What I could tell you is that our overtime costs from last year ranged around $195,000. Okay. And this is both savings oh, and... And excuse me, Mr. Spencer, and that is what it is in for next year. That would consider shift coverage, court overtime, training right. overtime. So 195000 So is the bulk of the savings then really in, in the salary as opposed to the benefit part of it? 
I think the bulk is overtime, and then you consider what the town would pay into the retirement on that <coughs> overtime cost. So yes, it, it's 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 both. The bulk of it, it's salary, bulk. though. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Further discussion on Article Six. Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. Thank you. Article 7, Road Improvement Projects. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $200,000 for the purpose of road improvement projects. It is anticipated that these funds will be used toward the cost of repairs to Broadview Drive, Chemo Circle, Pacheso Drive, Sadaway, uh, Cocohiha Circle, and other roads as necessary. Estimated 2018 tax impact of 22 cents. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 500. Not recommended by the Budget Committee 251. Mr. Perry. Hi. So um, just a little bit of feedback as to how this all came about. Originally, we had taken out the road improvement projects because we had sat down with the road agent. And we basically asked him to make a decision whether the truck was more important or the roads were more important. Because we knew we were facing the fire department bond. And with doing that, we didn't want to overburden the tax base. Well, now that the fire department, if it gets built and voted in, we don't have a payment this, for next this year. So that's why we reinstituted the road improvement projects for this year in the hopes that we can get people to pass it and it will actually help keep the tax base more level. So with that said, in 2017, well actually we currently maintain approximately 63 miles of road, which represents approximately $37 million in town asset. The pavement management program scores, we have 40% of our roads rated as an A, 34% rated as a B, 16% rated as C, 10% rated as D. In 2017, as you can see, Underwood, Hildreth, Nathan, High Plain, Molson, Whittemore, McQuestion, Gibson, Parker, paid parts of Page Road, the overlay on Albuquerque were all done as part of our road reclamation project. We used additional block grant fees that we got this year in the tune of 172000 which made us spend a total of 650000 on our roads this year. Paving 4.1 miles of road is a true testament to how great of a job our road agent is to be able to work with the funds he gets and be able to work with the contractors to get the most bang for our buck. So, in 2018, if we get this, we would have 201,000 from our highway block grant. We would have our 25,000, which is our money in the operating budget, which usually goes towards repairs, and our 200,000 from this warrant if it passed. That would be a total of 426,000. In 2017, our proposed projects would be Brookview, Chemo, Cohicus, Poseco, Sadaway, and that's it. Any questions, please feel free. Further discussion on Article 7. Mr. Bohm, BC. Ralph Bohm, 6 Gibson Drive. I'd just like to make a comment. Gibson Drive was done last year and didn't need to be reconstructed. All it needed to be is overlaid. And nobody, and I ask everybody on my street, to, do you think this needed to be done? I don't think anybody said no. I'm just wondering if any of the proposed roads that you're planning on next year, have anybody in the, those neighborhoods been asked, do you think we need to reclaim or overlay? And, and I got a feeling Gibson's going to have a washout, has it, all, has it done in the past. So I don't think we need to spend all this money we're doing on roads just because they're old. Further discussion on Article 7. Amy Goldstein, one spice per circle. I'm just wondering if we're allowed to ask the budget committee to say why they voted against sure. the implement. Maybe you can speak for the truth. Um, the budget committee voted against this because the discussion at that evening was that many people were actually for this article. But because of the tax cap, we could not legally um, recommend this article. It would bring us over the tax cap. So we voted uh, the majority uh, in opposition. Hey, 
And next year, assuming the fire station gets approved, will you be in the same situation, do you think? Well, I can say that the selectmen have said that we, we are trying to maintain it as a level field going across. The proposal that we had was to pull the road bond if the fire station gets passed so that that helps keep the tax fund level. Yeah, my, my point was I don't disagree with what, what you're doing, and I understand why the budget committee had to vote the way they did. I just am asking if they're going to be in the same predicament next year, if they think they are, and, and I do think they are. We will have to make difficult decisions about the base budget. The base budget, at first, needs to come in under the tax cap. Then wherever the base budget lands, we'll make a determination on whether there are any warrant articles we can recommend or not. Further discussion on Article 7? Somebody's moving. Rob, Bob. No, Bob's leaving. Okay, you'll find it on the ballot as written. Uh, Article 8. The plow truck lease purchase. To see if the town will vote to authorize the selectmen to enter into six year lease purchase agreement for the sum of $161,640 for the purpose of lease purchase purchasing a plow truck with equipment and, atta and attachments for the highway department and to raise the appropriate, raise an appropriate the, the sum of $26,940 for the first year's payment for that purpose. The first year's payment in the amount of $26,940 shall come from the unassigned fund balance and no amount to be raised from taxation. This lease agreement contains an escape clause, estimated 2018 tax impact of $0. And then there's a table showing the costs from 2018 to 2023. This is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 400 and recommended by the Budget Committee 600. Mr. Perry. Hi again. So, what we have here is we have a list of the current vehicles we have in the highway department. The one that we intend to replace would be the 1990 International Plow Truck that is 28 years old with 220, almost 222,000 miles. As you can see, looking through it, we also have a 2001 plow truck with 140,000. We have another one with 92,000. The newest one we have only has 18,000, but it is still nine years old. So this is not necessarily something that is a like to have. This is a need. We absolutely need to do this. Uh, these are the pictures of the 90 and 2000 trucks. We would replace the 1990 International Plow Truck, 28 years old, 200, everything I already said, 222,000 miles, no longer reliable due to the age and condition, will not pass state inspection in 2018 without major repairs to the frame and chassis. The estimated cost to the truck chassis is 91,000, the angle plow, wing plow, and dump body is approximately 60, and then there's about 10,000 in financing fees over the course of the loan which would make the cost approximately $161,000. Questions? Questions in Article 8? None. You'll hear it on the, you'll see it on the ballot as written. Article 9. Third year of library union, non-union wage plan implementation. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $10,000, $10,401 400, $10, to fund net salary adjustments to bring library employee salaries in line with the non-union employee wage plan as approved by the Library Board of Trustees in 2015. This article represents the third year of a three-year implementation plan, estimated 2018 tax Im rate impact of one penny. Recommended by the School Board 500, recommended by the Budget Committee 600. Mrs. Bonvillier, Bonvillier was to speak about this. There she is. I didn't get it right, did I? Bon bon you did. I did, okay. <laughs> So, good afternoon. Um, the trustees has approved a change to the wage plan in the 2015 following the town's implementation of the same plan. So this covers seven non-bargaining employees and it's not an across the board increase, it's just an adjustment for the structural deficiencies in the previous wage schedule. Um, so we anticipated a cost of 30000 to fully transition to the new plan and we are in the third and final year of this plan cycle. Further discussion on Article 9? Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. 
Article 10, thank you. Article 10, Town Earned Time Accrual Expendable Trust Fund. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $50,000 to be, to be placed in the Earned Time Accrual Expendable Trust Fund as previously established. This sum to come from the unassigned fund balance and no amount to be raised from taxation. Estimated 2018 tax rate impact of $0. This is, this is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 400 and it's recommended by the Budget Committee 600. Mr. Brown. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this fund was established in 2014. The purpose of the fund is to provide um, financial support for the uh, purchase of employees selling back their earned time. It's uh, to pay out all of the uh, time that they've accrued at time of retirement and uh, upon their separation. So the uh, current balance of the fund right now is $31,600. As you can see, for the past two years, we're ranging about $60,000 a year in, um, in all, all payouts. So that includes the benefits, all the payroll taxes. Um, this is a combination, these amounts represent a combination of payouts for uh, people that are selling time back at the end of the year, um, but also we've had employees retire. Currently, right now, we just took a look at our um, current census, and we have, we believe, about eight employees that are eligible to retire at any time, and the amount of time that they have accrued on the books is equivalent to about $94,500. Each year, we, we go through a financial audit, and our auditors take a look at this um, because they look at it as an unfunded liability, and they report back to the Board of Selectmen. Last year, at the end of the current, uh, at the end of the fiscal year, they determined that the liability to the town uh, was three hundred nine thousand dollars. So that's it's a large number. Um, it's not that realistic because we don't see unless our town went bankrupt and we closed one day, that number would be the amount that we owe all of our employees. Um, you know, at the day that we closed business. Further discussion on Article, nine, uh, Article 10? Hearing none, you'll find it in the ballot as written. Article 11, Building Systems Trust Fund. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $25,000 to be placed in the Building Systems Trust Fund as previously established, this sum to come from the unassigned fund balance and no amount to be raised from taxation, estimated 2018 tax rate impact of $0, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 500, recommended by the, board, the, the Budget Committee 600. Mr. Brown. Okay, again, this fund was established in 2013. Uh, the current balance right now is $30,900. The intent of this fund is to cover all the unanticipated major building repairs. So we carry um, operating costs in the operating budget to do mostly preventative maintenance, but we can handle a lot of the uh, minor repairs, like a furnace you know, breaks down, we've got to replace the motor or, or a fan, we patch roofs. But this fund is um, primarily for those major repairs. And those repairs could be things like septic systems, um, roof replacements, totally replacing a heating or cooling equipment, um, and dealing with some structural repairs. We have this year, for example, we had um, down at the fire station, the leach field failed, and we were looking at a total leach field replacement, but we were able to connect to the existing system to service the town hall, the old town office. Um, and that, that cost the town about $13,000. That's, that's not funding that we have in our operating budget, so it's we turn to this expendable trust fund um, to fund those types of repairs. We have a lot of buildings. Um, we got the town police building, the fire station, talent hall, the library, the highway garage, uh, recycling facility, the old town hall, and dog kennel. Um, and some of these buildings range from 19 to 150 years old. Further discussion, Article 11. Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. Uh, Article 12, Heritage Commission. To see if the town will vote to establish a Heritage Commission in accordance with the provision of RSA 673 and RSA 674 with members of the commission to be appointed by the Board of Selectmen. 
The Commission shall be comprised of five citizens with up to five additional citizens appointed as alternate members. The purpose of such a commission is to advise and assist with local boards and commissions conducting inventories, educate the public on matters relating to historic preservation, provide information on historical resources, and serve as a resource for revitalization efforts. A heritage commission can accept and expend funds from a non-lapsing heritage fund, acquire and manage property and hold preservation easements. This is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 400, Mrs. Queenan. Uh, Kimberly Queenan to Newstead Street, uh, Vice Chairman of the Planning Board. A Heritage Commission does for historical resources much what a Conservation Commission does for natural resources. They give local governments in New Hampshire new abilities to recognize and protect historical and cultural resources. A Heritage Commission may be established for the identification and protection of resources that are valued for their historic, cultural, aesthetic, or community significance. The establishment of a Heritage Commission is purely optional. Some, com some communities choose to have a Heritage Commission that is only advisory, while others want their commission to take a much more active role with uh, educational and technical responsibilities. What was presented to the Board of Selectmen to propose for Litchfield was a Heritage Commission that shall have an advisory and review authority only. Further, this, are you done, yeah, I'm sorry. Did you finish? No, I'm oh, on no, the sorry. next slide. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> All right, we're on the Y. A uh, Heritage Commission would fulfill a town entity currently missing, which can identify and discuss historic, cultural, and architectural resources that exist in Litchfield. Would have access to grant money to research and create an inventory of historically, cultural, and architecturally significant resources. Can serve to advise uh, other local boards and other local agencies in their review and requests of matters affecting potentially uh, cultural and historic resources. For the planning board, it could assist as requested in the development and review of those sections of the master plan which address cultural and historical resources. It could be utilized for future zoning ordinances and land use regulations that best serve the interest of the town. It is needed for the planning board's proposed demolition ordinance to assist in the review uh, of demolition permits for potentially significant structures built before 1960. A Heritage Commission would provide transparency to the town since its meetings are all public record. It could also coordinate activities with appropriate service organizations and nonprofit groups, again, which would all be publicized. Like other boards in the town, it would be a comprised of volunteers appointed by the selectmen. The Heritage Commission shall consist of no less than three members and no more than seven members who shall be appointed in a manner as prescribed by the uh, legal legislative body. The Heritage Commission member must be a resident of the city or town which establishes the commission. One commission member shall be a member of the local governing body. One commission member may be a member of the planning board while it's not recommended. Excuse me, while it is not required, it is recommended. Uh, Litchfield citizens have already expressed an interest to serve on the commission. Uh, the Heritage Commission um, members can also serve at the same time on other boards. How does it operate? A volunteer board that will hold public meetings, record the meetings, and if, if the demolition ordinance passes, um, get ready to post the signs for the demolition review ordinance. Although that's the end of the slide, I would like to say the startup cost of a Heritage Commission can start with no cost. Donations can be used for the limited cost it would take to run. Those limited costs would cover how the meetings would be recorded. We would need staff to do that, or maybe a volunteer could do that in the short term. It may require a training class. Um, if the demolition ordinance passes, we would need signs for the properties. If there is an interest later, the selectmen could add a budget to expand the role of the Heritage Commission. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, further discussion on Article 12? Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. Article 14, Beautification Expendable Trust Fund by petition. To see if the town will vote to establish a town beautification expendable trust fund pursuant to RSA 31 colon 19 dash A. 
for the purpose of enhancing community pride and identity in the variety of ways such as, but not limited to, purchasing flowers, trees, shrubs, signs, holiday decorations, monuments, and other amenities to improve the, vis the visual appearance of town buildings, facilities, roadsides, and landscaping. Further to raise an appropriate $2,500 to put in the fund, furthermore to name the, bun, the, the Board of Selectmen as agents to expend from said fund on proposal or petitions received from town citizens, groups and or boards and committees. The estimated 2018 tax rate impact is less than one cent. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 320, recommended by the Budget Committee 611. Mr. Brennan. Yep to discuss. I gotta go to the ice castle, so we gotta get this here. Let's right. go. Jason, hit the down arrow. No, I'm gonna hit the down arrow. No, 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 no. no. There we go. Okay. Tall in this town, I tell you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> so, whoever's left here, this is the feel-good worn article of the year. Uh, the intention of the beautification fund is to really spur community involvement, enhance community pride, and promote the beautification of, of Litchfield. And here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take $2,500, which is like 80-something cents a household, and put it into this beautification fund that would be managed by the Board of Selectmen. Then town citizens or town groups could petition the Board of Selectmen for the use of those funds for small uh, for small beautification projects. Maybe some street trees along Albuquerque, more flags, down 3A, a new town sign, and sprucing up some unsightly areas. And the intention is, is that the funds would be used for materials, but the people that petition for use of the funds would be the volunteers, and they would be responsible for developing or implementing the, the beautification activity. So the hope is that this will not only spur volunteerism, but uh, gi giving as well. I think if we can get a kickstart going here, we might be able to get some area businesses or people in town to kick in toward these types of activities and maybe we can spruce, spruce things up. Um, and lastly, you know, the good thing about this is it's a, it's a very low cost article, but you can see results. I can see if you're driving down Albuquerque now and you see a new tree that's planted, you can smile and you can know that your 83 cents for this year went to something good. So I hope you will uh, support this article. Further, dis further discussion on Article 14. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please. Uh, uh oh. Jason, uh oh. <laughs> William Barrett, 53 Pilgrim Drive. Uh, I'd just like to hear from the Board of Selectmen. Uh, they're not uh, in total agreement over this. So, since they're the folks you want to work with, uh, just can we hear from them what they possibly, uh, why they didn't recommend this? Uh, <laughs> sir, what was your name again? Sorry. William Barrett. I voted in favor. I think it was up from the floor. So come on. They're all kicking the dirt looking down. <laughs> They're all kicking at me. <laughs> um, so the reason why I voted no, just so clear, is that the way the water article was written, at least I understood it, we can't take donations into the fund. It's totally tax supported. My feeling was, and not against anything Jason was trying to do, because I think it's a good idea, we have lots of volunteers in this town that already do a lot of this. It's really about Let's just organize them better. And I think, you know, with Jason's efforts within the What's Up page, there's a lot of people interested in doing it, and those donations would come, and it shouldn't be a tax cut. And to be honest, I don't think the select would need to be involved other than just saying, thank you. So those donations can come. They just can't be deposited they into the fund. They can't be deposited into the fund. That was my issue. Further discussion, questions? On Article 14. Hearing none, you'll find it on the ballot as written. We're at the end. Okay. So before we close, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that the Warren articles discussed tonight will appear in the ballot as written or as amended. The next deliberative session is next Saturday, school. Uh, voting day is on March 13th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. here in the gym at CHS. Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? Seconded, anyone seconded? Second. We have seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Have a good day. Thank you Thank all. Thank you, everybody. Oh yeah, please, Scott, please.
um, uh, either bring it up on the front or make sure you leave it on the table in the back, the yellow sheets that you came with. Thanks for reminding me.